So this is the second week in our summer series, Summer Songs for the City. Um, five weeks as we look at the book of Psalms, a songbook which helps us to grapple with the high highs and the low lows of the human experience. And last week, Melissa kicked us off um, in a wonderful way, looking at Psalm 136, a psalm of thanksgiving. And we're going to do that refrain again this morning. Give thanks to the Lord for He is good for his steadfast love endures forever. Today, though, we're going to look at Psalm 27, a psalm that contains quite a few different emotions all in one. And this is real life, isn't it? Life isn't just a a series of sequential ups and downs. One day is really, really good, and the next day is the pits. No, if you've seen Disney's Inside Out movies, which I went to see with my kids recently, I maybe fell asleep halfway through for a little bit. Um, But they help us to remember that there is so much going on in the human emotions. Every single day, every hour, every minute, our emotions, they kind of blend together uh, based on what is going on around us, how we're feeling internally, fear, joy, hope, doubt, and all the other emotions. And these were the emotions that David, the psalmist, was feeling when he wrote these words. So we're going to read Psalm 27 together, all 14 verses, and the words will come up behind me, uh, but listen along. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When the wicked advance against me to devour me, it is my enemies and my foes who will stumble and fall. Though an army besiege me, my heart will not fear. Though war break out against me, even then I will be confident. One thing I ask from the Lord, this only do I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze on the beauty of the Lord and to seek him in his temple. For in the day of trouble, he will keep me safe in his dwelling. He will hide me in the shelter of his sacred tent and set me high upon a rock. Then my head will be exalted above the enemies who surround me. At his sacred tent, I will sacrifice with shouts of joy. I will sing and make music to the Lord. Hear my voice when I call, Lord. Be merciful to me and answer me. My heart says of you, seek his face. Your face, Lord, I will seek. Do not hide your face from me. Do not turn your servant away in anger, for you have been my helper. Do not reject me or forsake me, God my Saviour. Though my father and my mother forsake me, the Lord will receive me. Teach me your way, Lord. Lead me in a straight path because of my oppressors. Do not turn me over to the desires of my foes, for false witnesses rise up against me, spouting malicious accusations. I remain confident of this. I will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait for the Lord. Be strong and take heart and wait for the Lord. This Psalm 27 begins by the psalmist David, the king, reminding himself and other people of who God is, God's character and his nature. The American theologian A.W. Tozer once said, what comes into our minds when we think about God is the most important thing about us. And what David is doing here is he is rehearsing and replaying the character and nature of God to help him to keep his focus on Jesus, on who God is and what he has done. For us to be able to see our circumstances in the light of who God is. Verse one tells us that the Lord is his light and salvation. He's not just a light for some people. He is my light and my salvation. The one who helps me when I feel like I am down on the floor. He is my salvation. He has rescued me. I am forgiven set free, no longer chained to the things of my past because Jesus has come and died and been raised to life once again. The fact that Jesus has overcome the grave means that death no longer has any hold on me whatsoever. God is the stronghold of our lives, the place where we find shelter and peace in the chaos and the melee of daily life. So day by day, we're called to remind ourselves of exactly who God is and what he has done, just as uh, Melissa reminded us to do last week. 
And we see all the way through verses one to six, over and over again, David reminding himself and a group of people, because that's where this psalm would have been set, within um, the midst of a group of people, he's reminding them of the faithfulness of God, sharing testimonies of the battles that they would have faced and that the Lord would have fought on their behalf. And I can imagine this scene, David recounting these stories again and again, getting more and more excited, telling of the tales of how God has won the victory and the crowds cheering him on as he praises God wholeheartedly. And these verses from verse one to six, they're talking about God in the third person. He has done this. He will keep me safe. He will hide me in the shelter of his sacred tent. And this is really important to do. But what's really important is, and really interesting is when you get to verse seven, because in verse seven, it goes from the first person, God has done this, God will, to the first person. It's less about declaring who God is and more about coming to him personally and saying, Lord, please, would you, please, can you hear my voice when I call, Lord, your face I will seek. Teach me your ways, Lord. Do not turn me over to the desires of my foes, just to name a few. And some biblical scholars think that this is like a a sudden change in the tone. It's kind of like a handbrake turn in the middle of the psalm. Perhaps it's two different psalms that have been stitched together, one that's really positive and one that's more doubtful. But I think actually what this psalm does is it shows us the reality of what life is like day by day, what our complex emotions are like. I think this psalm shows us the apparent paradox that there is of being a Christian, that we can have hope and certainty about who God is, what he has done and what we believe and declare that he will one day do. And yet, if you're anything like me, you're filled with doubt and uncertainty as well. And today I want to tell you that that's okay. It was okay for David and it's okay for us. I think so many people think that faith is, um, faith and trust in God are like polar opposites, that they couldn't possibly coexist together. And that simply isn't true. Trust and doubt are not polar opposites, but two sides of the same coin. I've known quite a number of people who have been really going for it in their faith, following Jesus wholeheartedly, and they've either lost their faith or deconstructed their faith in some way because they haven't been able to let out some of these seemingly negative emotions. I'm not a good enough Christian because I doubt or have anxiety or worry or whatever the case may be. But the truth is, is that these seemingly negative emotions They're only really negative if they don't have somewhere positive to be explored together, to be processed together in community. That's why so much of what we do here at St. Peter's is not saying, hey, we do this thing together on Sunday and this is our collective way of worshipping the Lord, but on the rest of the week, you're on your own. No, we say we do this together as a family on mission, as the community of God, so that we can explore some of the high highs and the low lows of human experience together. Places and people where we can say, actually, I find this bit about following after Jesus really, really difficult. We have different ways that we can do this. We have the discipleship stream, which is um, an opportunity on Tuesdays every other week, which will be kicking off again in September to explore the Bible in more depth, to see some of the nuances about what it says and how we're called to follow Jesus together. And there's spaces in groups where we can discuss some of these things and wrestle with some of these biblical things in a really good way, collective an opportunity for 18 through to um, 29 year olds to be able to look at all that God is wanting to do as we learn to follow him as disciples together. Alpha, a place where we can explore the big questions of life together. There's so many ways that we can be involved in community, so many different ways that we can learn what it means to follow Jesus together, where we don't feel like we have to be on our A game all the time, but we can say, hey, this week I'm struggling. I want people to come alongside me, to encourage me, to pray for me. 
I can remember so many times in my life where I've been declaring the truths of who God is and simultaneously thinking, but actually, will God do it again this time? Perhaps he's not interested in me this time. Perhaps his blessing was just for that occasion. Like when we were missionaries overseas, Emily and I used to work with YWAM and we needed to raise 13,000 Australian dollars as a family for Emily to help to lead some medical mission trips. And we were going to Malawi to go and set up clinics in remote areas and then to go and serve the Rohingya refugees in the jungles of Penang, an island off Malaysia. And over and over again, as missionaries, we had seen the Lord provide for us in miraculous ways. We weren't paid a salary or a stipend to do it. We trusted fully that God was calling us to do this and that God would provide for us. And we had seen time and time again, pounds and dollars and every other currency that you could imagine in the world as received so that the God could do this work in and through us. And yet we faced needing $13,000. And I thought there's no way this time. No way at all that God will come through. But we prayed and we, we asked God, what can we do to help to begin to raise these finances in the natural? And the two things that we felt that the Lord asked us to do was one, to ask Emily's mum and her women's group to have a coffee morning. And that raised about $800, which was amazing. That was such a good start. That kind of broke the top, but they, we still needed a lot of money. And the second thing that we, we felt the Lord was asking us to do was to ask our church in Australia to do a bake sale. And we asked the pastors of the church in Australia and they said, yeah, we'd love to do a bake sale. And we've actually got two sites. So why don't we do a bake sale at both? And we thought, well, that's amazing because then we'll double up. Maybe we'll earn another thousand dollars or something. And um, what, the, what the church didn't tell us until the day was that they were going to match dollar for dollar what we raised from selling the cakes. So people were giving us $5 for a cake and we're thinking, great, well, that's 10. And 20 sometimes for a cake, well, that's 40. And we, we thought, well, that's incredible, just their generosity in that moment. But what they didn't tell us on top of that was that they were also gonna match dollar for dollar every single donation of 100, 200, $500 that people were giving towards our outreach. And between the women's group coffee morning and the bake sale, we raised exactly $13,000. Exactly $13,000. Now you'd think if you'd seen God's provision so perfectly, so immaculately like that, that after that you would never have any doubt whatsoever as to who God is. But I've got to tell you, I was still the biggest doubting Debbie out there. Sorry if you're called Debbie. I still had this insecurity and this lack of trust within me, even though God had shown himself faithful again and again and again. I ebb and I flow in my trust and my doubt. I'm fragile and I'm feeble and I am weak. And I'm like David, who is saying, please, don't hand me over to my foes, even though he's seen that God has provided again and again, fought the battles again and again and again. I want to encourage us this morning that faith and doubt are not polar opposites, but two sides of the same corn. If you have fear or anxiety in your life, whether it's related to finances or health or relationships, upcoming exam results, a career change or the fact that you can't get a job in the first place or one of a number of other things, the Lord sees all of it. The Lord knows all of it. He knows that as humans, we flip and we flop between trust and doubt. And yet here's the thing, God trusts in you. He doesn't doubt you. He knows you. He loves you. He forgives you. He is totally and utterly for you. He doesn't need you to reach your A game. He doesn't need you to just try and will up enough trust and faith. He says, I'm gonna meet you right where you are, right here, right now. God does not run out of patience with you because you're at a low ebb. The Lord wants to draw close to you 
by His Holy Spirit to accompany you into the darkest corners of your life, no matter what it is that you are facing. Jesus came to live His life amongst us, to show us that God was not distant and far off, but proximate to us in our struggles, to identify with us. So how do we bring all of this to God? Whatever emotions, mixed up feelings we have this morning. Verse 13 and 14, give us an answer. They're absolutely key for us day by day. These are verses that I remind myself of regularly. I remain confident of this. I will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Why don't we say these words together after me? I remain confident of this. I will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait for the Lord. Be strong and take heart and wait for the Lord. Friends, that's what we're simply going to do this morning. We're going to wait on the presence of the Lord, trusting and believing that His Holy Spirit was given to us as a gift to show us that even in our lowest moments, that God is with us. He doesn't stand off at a distance saying, come on, sort yourself out, get your act together, and then we can talk. No, He actively steps in to be with us.